We are welcoming you again in the second part of the presentation session. I'm really excited. Hopefully you are also excited too to see the wonderful solution in the next part. Um, we can go directly to the first presentation. Um, like me as individual working actually for the IT tech or the automotive industry, we recognize that there are always um, a gap between males and females in such kind of um, industry, actually. And everybody talk about it. Everybody mention how important we need actually females in this sector. And me personally, I recognize how efficient and how more powerful the team could be when we have like a female colleague with us. And I can't be like more thankful for such a projects like Girlbot. It's actually one of the cool projects that they put the focus on this issue. And I really liked what you do, guys. Um, so the stage is yours. We can see your camera. I think as soon as you share your screen, we can also start the presentation. Thank you. So uh, I hope you see my screen. Yes, we can see it. Okay, Please. perfect. Thank you, Abdul, for the intro. Um, I am Zoya and we are Bracelet Maker. We are making uh, a robotics toy. So when you think of robotics toys, you saw one uh, previously pitched, but also this is how they usually look like. And this is, for example, the top selling list in Amazon. I hope you see a pattern that we see as well, which is blue colors, Star Wars characters, boys playing uh, with the toys in the images. So that's why we are making a different kind uh, of robotics toy, Meet Bracelet Maker. Uh, this is a toy uh, made to uh, suit the interests of girls uh, who are aged from 8 to uh, 12. Uh, with the, the idea to help them learn uh, programming and robotics skills by doing what girls do for ages, which is making bracelets. Uh, so uh, apart from, um, it all started uh, two years ago, and in the meantime, we got a patent for the innovative knitting system, which supports uh, algorithmical thinking. We got different uh, five different prizes and uh, recognitions, including this one. And we've got a ton of positive feedback from girls, parents, and teachers uh, on, on more than 10 different events. We've showcased uh, the demonstrational toy um, across the Europe. Uh, this is how it started. Uh, this is Irena. She's my co-founder and she was always interested in robotics, but she wasn't that much interested in projects that she did uh, around robotics. And Irena is not the, alone. And this is uh, why uh, we are facing a gender gap issue in this area. And this is why only one third of students uh, in STEM fields are girls, only one fifth of tech employees are women and why uh, it looks like 60% of all uh, new jobs will be created in areas which are still dominated by men. And we want to change it and this is how we do it. First of all, we are keeping girls engaged in STEM in the age which is considered the key years for staying involved in STEM. So girls uh, get access and start playing with the similar toys as boys do, so they keep up the pace in understanding robotics and coding, which is one of the reasons why they drop out. And uh, we changed the perception of what robotics is. And also we got great uh, positive results uh, from everyone who, who was in contact with, the, with our toy, which is 85% of girls now see robotics differently, see it as something that they, uh, that they might be interested to build as well. Uh, so um, we hope that we will change this together and uh, that we because we can't keep building the future without women builders and this is uh, the change starts with girls. Thank you. Great, thank you for the presentation. Um, we can start taking the questions from the jury. Uh, but maybe before that, I would love to mention that um, this part of the session actually is about the young innov innovators from uh, like the age of 26. Uh, and less than that. And this is also like a great appreciation for the uh, participants. OK, great. So the first question is going to be from Ligia. Please, you can go ahead. Thank you for your pitch and your presentation. So much important. I even have a, a child that is turning six and her birthday present, uh, personal Christmas present will be like a robotics um, uh, toy as well. <laughs> so I really believe that's uh, very important. Um, 
I would like to know a little bit more about um, how many toys you said two two years already old. Yeah, how many toys have you? How many girls have you reached so far uh, with your your uh, solution with your toys? And also, how do you plan to expand? Are you only um, now target Serbia, or for example, if I want to get one, I could get here in Austria. <laughs> Uh, thank you for a great question. Just to clarify, so we started two years ago with building the, the whole thing and what we have is something that we call the demonstrational uh, toy or tool, which is used uh, as a demonstrational tool to showcase only that robotics can be interested for girls. So we are showing them how everything works, but it's a big uh, prototype aimed for educators. So we present it in science fairs, maker spaces, uh, in schools. So far we've reached uh, 15,000 uh, girls across these events uh, but uh, we've realized that what we do is we create interest but there is there is a frustration because parents once once they go home they can't follow up so that's why right now we are building a toy we are now in the process of building it uh, we've um, gotten 100,000 euros of funding so we are almost uh, going to be uh, close to closing it so I think this spring you'll be able to buy your toy uh, your girl this toy Great, thank you. Um, I would like to have also more questions from the jury. Please, auditor. Hi, thank you very much. It's super exciting. Um, how are you building the toy? Like, what is required? Like, what uh, resources do you need to actually build the prototypes and then the toys as well? Uh, so right now we are working with uh, hardware engineers, software engineers, Iran electronics in engineers. So we are all uh, quite involved and we are uh, very much uh, 3D printing the, the solution as well. Uh, we've designed it so that girls start with assembling the toy. That's the first uh, step how they learn uh, 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 the basics. And then they are also using uh, software tools to recode it and change the designs. Um, right now, the toy is most like we are also negotiating with people in Shenzhen uh, so that we actually produce the first batch uh, in China because we want to start kick it off the toy to kick off the toy with the Kickstarter campaign because we think it's a great way to test the market. And once we get the, the feedback, that's when we will probably move the production to Europe and Serbia. Great, thank you. Um, is there any more questions from the jury? Uh, because I see like there are no questions more. If there are not, then I would really like to thank you. Oh no, we have a question from Ligia again, please. Yeah, it's so exciting to see. So now I understand the stage that you are in your um, um, uh, um, uh, solution and your company, so to say. Um, what do you say that your ultimate impact vision? So, and how do you plan to actually measure it then uh, when you are in the next phase now that it's upcoming? Yeah. So first of all, we want, we we will be able to measure uh, how how often the product is used. But what we want to be for us, this is only a beginning. The uh, making bracelets is just the first toy that we want to make to access this untapped uh, half of the kids population when it comes to robotics toys. So we would like to create a, a subscription model for uh, and covering other segments of robotics, which is suited more to female interests uh, than it is right now. And how we will measure it, first of all, by the number of users, but also by the number by the quantity of how much the tool is used and what is more important we want to build two toys which are social so it's not just girls building them in their own room but uh, for example with this in particular we want to make the bracelets also part of the growth hack tactic so that for example once somebody uh, gifts this type of bracelet the pr the mothers friends everyone can brag uh, and talk uh, how they are actually supporting their girls in STEM. So we want to increase both the, the perception of STEM, but also the number of users. Thank you so much. That was really great. And all the answers, uh, all the questions are answered. Um, thank you again for the presentation. Uh, we can go again for another brilliant 
presentation and idea. It's again about managing management of resources. Uh, what I really believe in actually like being uh, working for the industry is actually there are a lot of resources there and people or companies pay a lot of money for them, produce so much CO2, but in the end, they are sometimes on the site without being used for hours, sometimes days, waiting for the next construction or for the next task, task to be happened. I was really impressed by the idea um, of what you did, guys. Um, so we are going to hear the presentation from Sherimac. Uh, please, we can see you on camera. You can start sharing your screen and your slides. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, can you just give me a heads up if the screen is visible? Yes, it's visible. Please take your time and start. Perfect. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for having me and for the great opportunity. My name is Manuel. Um, I am the CEO of ShareMac, and um, today I'm very happy to present you our vision of building Europe's um, leading software as a service platform for the construction and rental industries. Um, before I go on with our impact and, you know, I guess all of your questions, we have prepared a short video for you actually that explains clearly the problems we're solving and the solutions we're providing. So please enjoy and then I'll continue with the presentation. So this is the current situation. Construction sites are not digitalized. Companies don't know where their machines are, how long they are in use and when will the next project take place. And very often everything is still done completely analog with pen and paper. ShareMax concept is quite simple. Our unique and comprehensive software, the Smart Asset Manager, collects all important information in one place and with just a few clicks connects machines, projects and people. Less headache, more efficiency. This is ShareMax. Again, now see my screen. Um, yes, we can see it, where? please. So those are the problems and the solutions that we are providing. As you can already have a, get a bit of a feeling, it's a B2C business model, a B2B business model, sorry. Um, but instead of boring you with the technical details of our solution, I would like to focus much more on the impact that our solutions actually bring. So if we take construction companies, we're of course digitalizing a lot of processes through one central platform. We are reducing paperwork of in up to in some cases actually in 90 uh, like up to 90 percent in some cases, which of course has an immediate impact on our environment. We are decreasing the disposition time spent on machine like the the machine disposition time by approximately 70 percent, which of course immediately comes back to all the resources that are needed usually for this. We have furthermore optimized workflows. We are increasing machine utilization by 20 to 30 percent as a result of our software and naturally fewer machines are needed, fewer machines are bought and obviously as a result the whole thing goes back to the environment and naturally of course for efficiency and profit for construction companies. If we have a look at society, um, we have faster construction projects thanks to our solutions and definitely we have less burden on the environment as a whole. We're optimizing the infrastructure currently in, Ger in Germany, but also Europe-wide quite soon, since we are already quite an international young company, let's put it like this. We have less stress for everyone, thanks, for, uh, thanks to our solution. Naturally, CO2 savings, um, something that results pretty much directly by um, you know, increasing the machine utilization and having less machines on construction sites. And last but not least, we have also a great cooperation with a company called Brink, which plants a tree for each machine we actually register in our software. And as a result, of course, um, we have an indirect impact on the environment, but also quite a direct impact through the direct um, planting of trees. We have a great team in Germany, 15 people, and in Georgia, 26, where our tech daughter company lies. The guys in Georgia are responsible for the further development of the software and the quality maintenance. Whereas in Germany, um, yeah, we are dealing with topics such as key account management, marketing, and generally, um, yeah, market presence. Let's put it like this. So thank you on my side. I hope that was clear um, and a little bit entertaining. Um, uh, thank you so much. Happy. We can move directly to the questions. Uh, yeah. Odetta, please, um, you can go ahead. I would really actually love to hear more about the solution and how do you actually make it work? 
because it seems that you're connecting the machines, but also providing some planning tools. And I know uh, that actually getting construction people onto digital platforms is super difficult. So how are you getting and making that happen? Because, yeah, it's just not the type of uh, people who like to work yeah. on iPads. Um, Odetta, so first of all, you're very much right in everything you said. At the moment, we have um, 10 paying um, customer, like 10 paying um, corporate customers, including a huge contract with Travac, which is one of Europe's largest construction companies. You're absolutely right. We are connecting the machines into a system. We are gathering telematic data directly from them. We also have our own telematic solutions developed. And through the standardization, aggregation, and general normalization of this data, we are feeding into our smart asset manager. We are improving project management, equipment utilization, transport organizations, and in general, transport efficiency, which results in all those things that I showed you on my presentation. And in terms of onboarding, um, <laughs> you're absolutely right. It is very difficult for construction companies to do the first step, but the moment they realize the value added that they can have through one central platform, from then on it gets um, easier. Of course, it is not a business model that is B2C, and therefore scalability is a little bit more different, but on the other side, the stickiness of the business model is um, enormous. So once you get a client, it is almost impossible for the client to then leave the system First of all, because it becomes a business critical system for them. And second of all, because honestly, we are working our asses off every day to make it better for them. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Christian. Yeah, thank you very much. Very interesting. This is indeed uh, a hot topic and it's a very interesting industry to innovate. And I was going to ask about Strava because I know they are the ones which are doing a lot of projects in that field. Um, I also know from, from Strava that it's um, but it's still people and uh, workers and human beings on the construction site and they, they need to interact with digital tools and they often lack the skills or sometimes it's also maybe not well or they're not willing to change or adapt to those new, new tools. How do you tackle this? Because I think this is for sure a bottleneck in your business. Um, how do we tackle exactly what how do we how do we make them use the system or or what exactly do you, are you referring to um, Christian? Yeah, when you think of people at the construction site, they used to work with, you know, like with paper and, and all these old school tools for, for decades. And now um, you have to teach a 55 year old uh, driver of a, of a I don't know, truck or something um, to engage with those digital interfaces. And it's not going to be easy, I think. No, it is definitely not easy. Um, it needs to be, so this is here, here I think lies the tricky part of taking a process that is um, generally quite complex, quite spontaneous and changes all the time, for example, on the construction site and making an interface that is literally dummy proof. So it needs to be almost like if you, if you refer to gamification, they need to have fun with it and um, they need to see it's, it's something cool. Of course, it needs a lot of, you know, drive on our side to be persistent, to do all the Schulungen with them, all the onboardings. And um, nowadays, most construction sites, if we're talking particularly about Strabag, but also other companies do have bureau containers on every construction site, which they have, of course, electricity, internet, they have a stationary computer. And naturally, we also have our part of mobile applications, which we are then giving them directly through their mobile phones. Um, but I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it's easy. It is definitely not easy, um, but it's definitely something that, that is worthwhile and that they all see at the end of the day it's actually a better way of working rather than um, writing in it, everything on paper that is then lost at the end of the day. Great, thank you. One last short question from Frank, please. Uh, Frank, could you please? Um, yeah. Uh, you are re-muted again or? How, how many machines do you yeah. have in your portfolio? And how do you expand it? Do you also want to build a pool cross company and expand to a developing economy where you can have much more social impact? At the moment, we have, I think, close to 10,000 machines in the system. Um, most of them are also tagged with our own telematic devices, beacons, and S boxes. Um, in terms of expanding, our main focus for the next two years would be to push actually the smart asset manager into the market because this brings, of course, machines into the system, market image, and let's face it, proper revenues with which we are growing as a company. Um, and the next step, the visionary step would also be then eventually to connect 
construction companies to um, rental companies and to create one central marketplace where construction companies can, through our smart asset manager, not only deal with their own resources, but also exchange resources, purchase resources, and also eventually rent machines directly from rental companies. It sounds a bit monopolistic if I put it like this, but we firmly believe that if um, the biggest benefits for all, including for the environment, lies if we have one system that can manage all those resources. It's a big vision. We'll see how far we can bring it to. Um, but so far, it's going quite well. Let's put it like this. Sounds great. Good. Thank you for the wonderful presentations and thank for the questions from the jury. We can go directly to the next um, wonderful project. It's user will. If we talk like 10 years ago, what will happen to our data if we pass away? Everybody will say like this is science fiction idea and nothing will gonna happen. Actually, we are facing this now and so many people uh, sadly passing away after having like virtual online clients and uh, sorry accounts and and a lot of data behind so what will happen to this data this is a huge issue was handled by the team of user will from germany um i would love to ask the team to uh, present their slides and we can start listening to their presentation okay great we can see the screen uh, but we can't hear anything, so please, if the mic is muted. Okay, hello everyone. Okay, great. Yes, you can start. We can see the screen. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for this huge opportunity. And I'm looking forward into the future and uh, wish you all, all good luck. Uh, good luck. So, start. As a positive patient or a grieving relative, the last thing you want to think about is managing the digital afterlife, or the letting a Netflix subscription or a Twitter account. My name is Frederick Heigel and I have two host pieces and I helped 580 individuals with the usual team um, uh, by doing digital afterlife management. Okay. We at Usable are building a resilient community of advisors and an intelligent database management based app, which helps. That's our input. Login, verification, managing. Working with smart contracts makes a safe IT environment, and using the chances of a public blockchain technology is the back end, which makes Usable novel. But we are not only providing a tool for us pieces, we are building an app for everyone and a community of helpers. We encourage the generation who told the parents that streaming services are cooler than listening to the radio to convince relatives that they should start think about digital afterlife management. Our vision is a world in which everyone in the internet has managed his or her digital afterlife. And if we help people, and users or relatives are fine and thankful, we can measure if our input's making an impact. Our pillar are UN goal 9, UN goal 16, and UN goal 17. Blockchain code is resilient. Everyone from Africa to Japan should have the right to manage the digital afterlife and to help a lot of people. Usable needs partnerships for the goals with internet platforms and databases of countries. Brown, thank you from Germany and see you. Thanks for the great presentation. We can go directly to the questions from the jury. Um, uh, the jury, please, you can start addressing the questions. The first question is actually from Odetta. Hi, thank you, Frederick. I just wanted to ask you a bit about like the user journey. How does it actually work? So do I register as a user or do I get my relatives to register? And like, what hurdles do you actually face when you're inviting people to do something about after they pass away? Yes. So if you have an account at Usable, you get a code. And the code you can take uh, relatives. And if you die, the relatives send us the code and the death certificate. And we put this in our database and share the information with all the um, managed data 
you um, late in our app before. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is from Gina. Hello. Hi, Hi Gina. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to ask, in terms of data management, I know different countries have different um, data regulation and data management laws. How does your company comply with those? Obviously, if you're working cross-nationally. Yes, first of all, that's a European problem and then a world problem. In Europe, we have the problem that databases in countries are not the same. So we have to talk with a lot of politician, politicians and cit uh, citizens about a European digital death register. So for now, we just have to um, take the data from every country, but it would be much easier to have a European death register and the access to the registers of different countries to help the people. But I looking, I'm looking for work because the theme is something which, which could help a lot of people. So I think databases uh, will be will be open for for things like that. Thank you. Uh, Kristen, could you please ask your question? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I am also asking the same direction. Um, so imagine that uh, if I understood the business model or the case right, correct me if I'm wrong, um, you got the you get somehow the, also the access with your database to all the different uh, social media accounts of a person. How can you establish trust that people put their things in your hands if I understood right the solution? Yeah. Um, it's about partnerships for the girls. We have to make partnerships with big uh, internet companies or big platforms, and then the people will maybe trust us. So it's all on us. We have to build a strong community with a warm heart, and then we have to um, take the chance to build a community for the girls. Great. Um, uh, one last question from Ligina, please. Or Ligia, sorry. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, my question goes in, in in understanding what stage you are. So understand that you are still testing the app, if I'm not mistaken. And how how is then so far your traction or the acceptance of your business idea from from the customers? Yeah. Uh, thank you. We started at the beginning with a cooperation with a hospice and just helped free cancer patients by giving them iPads and giving the data in, 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 in our environment. And then we put all together and made something out for, for other for, for other people. Then we made a second cooperation with a hospice that, and then a lot of more people came, came out. And so we helped uh, or advised 518 people um, by now. And um yeah and <laughs> what was the question again sorry um was about the acceptance also and the feedback that are gaining oh. from the users yeah. yeah and the feedback is mainly about um if if we if we if we help if we help them they 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 come like the relatives could come back and say Thank you in a different way. It's 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 not so like like in another company where you can get a, a easy thank you or a easy easy your, your your product is good because it's a really difficult theme. Um, yeah. Great. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. I think that was all the questions. Um, we can gladly move to the next wonderful project and presentation. Um, it's actually from Hungary at this time. It's from um, Colibri charity team. Um, yeah, actually, I was really impressed the time I was uh, seeing the information and the whole description about the project is actually how easy and how um, like user friendly they made their solution because this is actually going to impress you. I think as it was impressing me. So if the team is ready, um, we would love to hear your presentation, actually. Um, I can see the screen. Uh, I still can't hear your voice. Hey. OK, great. Yes, we can see. Is it not turned on? Um, please, you can turn on your camera. So we can see the screen, but we can't see the camera yet. Okay. 
Okay, perfect. Yes, everything like is this, ready. Or... Great. Yes, you can start, please. Uh, yeah, I just have technical problems. Sorry. Yes, great. Take your time, please. Hey, everyone. I am Andres Bodo from Colleague with Charity. Today, I am proud to introduce a new way of giving that is easier and more enjoyable than ever, and yet it's capable of changing the world in a better direction with the simple will of the people. We have two products, the Colleague Web Platform and the Colleague with Make Charity Web Purchase Browser Extension. I would like to talk about the extension first. It's already available for the most common browsers like Chrome, Firefox, or Edge, and it's totally free to add without any difficult setups. With the extension, Colibri makes charity shopping available on a large scale by asking users if they like to turn their shopping charitable at over 2,000 online stores. With each uh, charitable with each making each charitable activation, our users can raise a part of their purchases to their selected non-profit organizations without paying anything extra. Because after each activation, the store will offer one to 20 percent digits of their illegal transactions to charitable purchases in cooperation with Colibri. In other words, Colibri users can generate micro donations after each of their online shopping, plus decide who should get it. And the best thing is that cause them nothing. Also, the extension helps them ha helps them shop smarter and more consciously by showing them which businesses are supporting environmental and social causes and which are part of Colibri. One of the on the Colibri web platform, users can choose an organization to support and uh, or recommend one to join. See the list of stores who have already joined, invite their friends and do a lot more. All supportable organizations have their own quality page so that they can easily share it to get even more support uh, from their community. When I talked about at the beginning about changing the world, I really meant uh, it with Colibri, our goal is to create sustainable development by turning online shopping into a charitable act and collecting micro donations after each sale. Micro donations can add up quickly when many people join. So together we can achieve changes that were not possible before. To get an understanding of the possible impact of Colibri, here are, here are some numbers and a little explanation for that. If all the detailed sales had been made charitable with Colibri in 2021, we could have ended up raising up to almost 147 billion dollars for charitable purposes. Fun fact: from that, we could have ended world hunger and other large-scale world problems. Colibri directly supports the 2012 Sustainable Goal, which is to ensure sustainable consumption and production. But so Colibri users can support our 17 goals. 85% of our donations directly go to charities. Thank you for your kind attention and please feel free to ask any questions you may have. Great, thank you so much for the presentation. I think we are ready to take the jury questions. Uh, please, you can take your time and think about any questions that you would like to ask. So Odetta is the first jury to ask, please. I'll go first to start the questions. Thank you very much for a great presentation. And it seems like you have some incredible partners, like business partners who trust you to uh, kind of, you know, uh, take the donations of their customers and into your system. But can you tell a little bit about how do you onboard those huge e-commerces? And also, how do you decide on which charities to then uh, send the money to? And how there is like, how do you, a guarantee that the money hits the charities and how do you build that trust across the ecosystem? Okay, so if that wasn't clear, our users can select their own by who they want to support with Colibri. And uh, for the other part of the question, we public uh, quarter financial reports with transaction numbers whenever possible to make, uh, to make possible for charities to check uh, or guarantee that uh, they get the money. And uh, we are working with larger and not that large e-commerce partners, and we are always open to work uh, and to create new partnerships. Great, thank you. Um, the first question is from Gina. 
Hi, this is a fantastic idea. Um, how do you vet the non-profits that are on the system? So how do you vet that the money is going where it's said to be going? Where is that transparency? Yeah, we are checking all the, all the non-profits who, who join and uh, about the technical part. So we send donations through their online web platforms or websites because most of them are, have their own donation page under their web, under their web page. And uh, whenever it's not possible, we are cooperating them in email to, to send the support to them because it's there. Thank you. Um, another question from Odetta. Uh, yes, it's actually, again, a couple of questions probably in one. First of all, like, how do you get users to download your, uh, the, the plugin? Like, how do people find out and like, how do actually they um, install that plugin? And also the second question is, so are you actually signing deals with Nike and other uh, e-commerces to be executing their, um, their charity uh, goals? Or do you do it somehow just like a layer on top? It's a layer on top at the moment, but in the future we would like, uh, because we have launched two weeks ago or a few weeks ago, and we are growing and we are growing very fast, but we are still in a testing phase. So we can make, a, we can understand more about uh, this behavior. And uh, for the for the first, uh, okay, so users can download our extension from each browser store. So, and also it's a, the back links are available on our website. But what I mean is like, how do you get the users into your website to find out about the extension? Because you need to do some marketing. Yeah, we, so that yeah for that out. we use uh, the branded page for each non-profit on Colibri so that they can share on socials or whatever they would like. And uh, anyone who visits those links can understand easily what's Colibri and, uh, and download or add the extension. So in cooperation with, uh, with the non-profits. Great, thank you. And Gina, do you have another question maybe? Or because I can see your virtual hand is raised. Okay, I think not, no problem. Um, so great, thank you for the presentation. I think maybe we can move to the next question or to the next great presentation. Um, okay, so the next wonderful solution on the list is something imaginary actually it's like something like science fiction i think if you tell somebody a few years ago that you are a student and you have so many notes and information noted down in your notebook in your in your laptop and you want to summarize them all in the end of your semester like somebody would tell like oh my god i wish if there was a robot who would do something like this and i think this is real now and i really have a huge respect for this kind of solution because it could be really helpful in so many directions not only for students um i will leave the rest for the uh, wonderful team to present from ireland um the snap study um we can see you on camera please you can start presenting your slides and your presentation Okay, great. We can see the slides. Please. Can everybody can... hear me? Yes, please. We can we can Perfect. hear you see you very well. Okay. Hi everybody. My name is Vagip. I am from Ireland and I'm here to present my product Snap Study, which is changing the way students revise all around the world using AI. As a student myself in high school, it's very clear the revision is flawed. All the methods that I used, such as rereading, were inefficient. And even though I was spending more time trying to memorize these, I wasn't really learning the content which led me to trying to learn just to pass tests, not really understand what I was learning. I found it really hard to motivate myself to study because learning didn't become fun. It became almost a burden that I had to face every single day. Additionally, all the content teachers gave me wasn't personalized to my needs. May I struggled with some aspects of the language in English, while others didn't. I decided to combine my technical skills and create a solution, Snap Study. Very simply, the app allows students to take images of their notes, lecture slides, and generate flashcards and summaries using state-of-the-art artificial intelligence. I've developed 
proprietary deep learning models that are personalized to your content. So you get the questions and summaries that you really need to focus on. In, in turn, what you get is a more knowledge-based approach. Students really require to think about the answers and not just trying to memorize them for a test. They remember it much better and they don't have to spend as much time, resulting in their time being more productive when revising and they also end up being more motivated to learn. It becomes almost like a game to see how many questions they can get right in the flashcards. Here's a quick product demo. So you start off with a one tap sign in just to get you on board. You go and you pick whether you want a flashcard or summary. You pick images or take them. You wait a few seconds and you get your flashcard or summary that you can access offline or online. Snap Study is not a product, it is a movement. We're on a mission to use AI to change how people learn knowledge. And we've already got 1,400 daily active users on both iOS and Android. And 73% of our app users reported their time was more productive spent in revising for tests. We've also onboarded 12 edtechs to subscribe to our model licensing and will help to contribute to our overall main goal, which is to get more quality education in the world with a focus on educational content. In conclusion, I want to say that Snap Study is an innovation that solves a real issue, which is people learning from marks using AI through a personalized method and replaces inefficient methods, resulting in better understanding and can be scaled not just to students, but edtechs, HR teams, and medical students. Thank you very much, and I hope to answer your questions as best as I can. Great, thank you for the presentation. I think, yes, we are ready for the questions from the jury. Um, please take your time, the jury, to raise your questions. The first question is from Digia. Please take your time. Thank you very much for this interesting pitch and very interesting solution also for an important problem. Um, I would like that to hear a little bit, if you can elaborate a little bit more in the end, you mentioned that you have a B2B um, licensing model, but you also have a B2C model. Can you elaborate a little bit um, um, on these two models and um, of your solution? Yeah, great question. Thanks very much. Um, so for the B2C, we may, it's an app that is targeted more for students and individual users, so they can really spend less time making these flashcards at the same time and uh, as learning much more efficiently. Whereas the B2B is more focused on providing the models that I and my team have built to apply to their own edtech platform so that their students can also reap the benefits of our model. It's more white label towards them. We have four uh, about four VC backed edtechs who have taken the license and the rest are just edtechs from all around the world, ranging from Australia to Singapore. So I hope that answers your question. Great, thank you. The next question is from Odetta. Hi. Oh, sorry, mute and mute doesn't work for you properly. Um, thank you. Like, I really congratulate you on your positive reviews on, on Google Play Store. That's very nice to see. But can you elaborate a little bit about how do you use the AI aspect? Because I saw that you showed some pictures of like your notes and then kind of way showed the flashcards it seemed that it's already kind of systemized and it's not the same pictures anymore so can you just uh, tell a bit more yeah great question so essentially what you do is you can either take pictures or you can upload pictures from just a simple image picker and then once you pick your images they all go to the back end and they're used we use ocr to for printed and handwritten to convert those into text and then those that text gets sent to all our different models that generate the questions and return them back in flashcards. Alternatively, if you want a summary, the text gets sent to our deep learning summary generator, which takes this text and gives you back the summary in not a matter of hours, but in a matter of minutes and even seconds, depending on how much text is there. So it's not that the images are removed, it's more that they're converted from an image, but into text using our OCR software. Thank you. The next is it already properly uh, reading? Sorry, just a kind of sorry. like is AI and your technology already properly reading every handwritten note? Like, is it actually working properly? I'll be honest, my handwriting is terrible. So even even I can't read it myself, so I can't really understand that. I can't blame the AI for not reading it. But we have tested the model. And if you uh, have legible writing that a person can read, 
95% of the time, the model can read it. We did a few benchmark tests to evaluate it. So yes, it is quite accurate. Obviously, it's AI, so the more data, the better. But uh, we're always training our models on our custom data sets to improve them all the time. So we hopefully get to a state where it will run seamlessly on even my handwriting. Great. The next question is from Barbara, please. Thank you. I want to know how many people um, use your solution or is it a, a prototype at the moment? Yeah, great question. So it's a, it's currently a public beta. We, I, we have about 1,400 daily active users as of the beginning of this November, mainly through our network. We haven't really gone for paid marketing as I believe more in product led growth wherein your product kind of leads to growth and you don't have to pay for marketing, as in if the product brings enough value, then more people will use it. So we've seen kind of that trajectory go up and it's mainly been ranging from high school students, but we have seen a small segment of medicine students. Uh, there's a student specifically studying in Stanford as well as in Cambridge using this and we've got good feedback that we've used to iterate and improve our product. Great, thank you. The last question is from Angelica, please. Uh, Angelica, we still can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry, thank right, you. Please. Thank you very much for your inspiring uh, solution. Uh, it's a follow-up question actually to what Barbara asked. So uh, how do you plan on getting more users on board? Are you reaching out to high schools or universities or are you going directly at the pupils? That's a great question. So it's a bit of both, if I'll be honest with you. We've uh, There's a few local universities that I've agreed to have kind of B2B deals, wherein their students in the universities will be using this software white labeled so that more people can drive towards our SDG goal of quality education. And for the high school students, we really plan to use social media a lot. I think it's the most effective medium, as well as a few influencer marketing the people and strategies to reach out to them as, as quick as possible to help them change their ways of revision. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, there are still more questions, but we can take it because of the time. Uh, thank you for the presentation and we can gladly move to the next wonderful project from North Macedonia. Thank you. Actually, I was really uh, impressed when I saw the video that you posted from the team about the whole project and I was like really impressed of um, how encouragement and how motivated you are in the team. And um, this is actually another project wonderful project where um, like change somehow the habits of the user to be more uh, green or like environment um, oriented and um, I love this kind of solutions actually where we don't have to stop doing something but we only do something alternative and we keep doing what we like so I'm more interested to hear about the project and I think all of we are and please take your time to start the presentation Awesome, thank you so much. Just to check, you can hear me well and see my screen? Yes, everything is great. Awesome, thank you so much. Well, hello everyone, buckle up because I'm going to take you on a ride to Skopje, North Macedonia. So as you can see, uh, Skopje, North Macedonia is this beautiful, shiny place. But apparently most of the year it looks like this, covered with smoke and thick air pollution. Now, if you think what on the world is happening out there, let me tell you that all of this pollution is actually as a result of three main causes. First is wrong assumptions, as people assume that they're not capable of doing anything. Then is the lack of knowledge, as people don't know the negative impact that's created in the first place. And even if they know, they don't have an opportunity to measure it. For that honor, we are creating Android to help those people to be more sustainable through their day-to-day -day activities. First and foremost, Android helps them to shop for more sustainable products. By scanning the barcode or entering the link, they are able to see what is behind their favorite brand. Additionally, the app gives more eco-friendly products for them to see based on their preferences. Next, it helps them to eco-friendly transportation. No, it doesn't say go to bike everywhere, although that would be lovely, but what it does is actually combines all the activities in a combination with the least amount of CO2 emissions. And last but not least, it helps young children to grow their skills in this area by eco games and climate education. 
So apart from being the first ever green social media, Android is special because it's directly personalized and allows you to make changes on the go. No technical knowledge is required. And because we have users from over 200 countries around the world, we are able to build an international community. So till now, we have around 10,000 users on our application and 180,000 kilograms of CO2 emissions were reduced. In plain English, that would be around 720 clean carbon offsets reduced. Well, now growing and scaling our application, well, reaching 6,000 6, users for around a year, our goal is to reduce one metric tons of CO2 emissions, which would be a carbon offset for 20,000 citizens, which would mean that this application has the impact to reduce the carbon of a small city. That is the power of tech that we are representing. So we are working mainly in the SDG 13, but we are closely collaborating between SDG 11 and SDG 17 to reach our mission. Of course, we are proud of the local. We provoke alternative uses of transportation, reduce the amount of pollution, and also involve youth to action. But also, we are proudly global, as we have our representatives in over 50 countries around the world, which are sharing the voice of CO2 reduction in their own communities. I want to tell you that our planet, unfortunately, has a deadline, and we have around seven years before major consequences hit our planet. And you don't want to be a part of this. That's why, join us. Let's make the safe CO2 emission, the new likes, and let's write history together. Thank you so much, and I'm welcoming all your questions. Great, thank you so much for the presentation. The first question is immediately coming from Gina. Hi, I just wanted to ask what specific criteria you're using to measure um, environmental sustainability here. Do you have a certain criteria that's available for users at all? Yes, so we have two different criteria that we are using it. The first one for the CO2 emissions, we are actually checking according to the uh, there's the standard, uh, according to the United Nations, how much CO2 emission a user produces through their day-to-day -day activities. And we are using the new uh, concept, so what are they will create through their new, I would say, combination to check it with that one. For example, if uh, the average is used to 20 kilograms, and with the app you are creating only like five kilograms, then it's counted as 50 kilograms reduced safe. On the clothes spectrum, when you are buying more sustainable clothes, we are actually checking how the company is uh, using their resources. Of course, we are not doing all the research. We are currently using databases that are uh, um, that are online by United Nations, Oxfam America, Eternity. So these databases are already researched, and we are just conveying the information that is present in, uh, I would say, uh, plain English, so that everyone can understand it. Thank you. The next question is from Laila, please. Yes, yes. Thank you. Actually, I did have the same question about the measurement, but I have another one. How do you encourage users to use this one? What kind of, uh, I don't know, loyalty awards do you provide them? Or what kind of information you're providing to your users in order to contribute and use these and follow the, what you're actually proposing? Absolutely. Thank you so much for this question. So firstly, we started collaborating with local NGOs, with local schools, so that they are able to motivate their students so we have actually found out that two approaches are the most valuable. First of all is counting points. So when they're saving CO2 emissions, they're actually saving points along the way. So with every saved point, they're able to redeem it for, um, I would say, some of the, um, the tickets for alternative transportation or some free clothes from the eco-friendly uh, companies that we already have as partners. So they're able to get free gifts. And on the school spectrum, when they're actually working in classrooms, their teachers are giving them plus points in all the different activities they pursue, especially in primary school, so they keep the children motivated to go on and collect the stars and the points. So that's basically it's a one way of competition, but not on likes, as I said, on CO2 emissions. Thank you. The last question is from Odetta. Thank you. It's a very interesting and huge project. Um, uh, how do you onboard those partners that give something in return and especially across so many countries because that's usually like a big issue for um, onboarding the partners and then another question is so on Google Play it says that you have like five installs so how do you like which which platforms are the key for you in terms of like the 3000 users that you have across the platform Absolutely. So for the first question, how do we onboard all of these, um, I would say, 
uh, companies. We are mostly looking forward uh, the ones who are online, so that basically users can uh, can be connected to all the, the, the world. Um, that is the main concept. Or our local ambassadors, as I said, uh, can onboard something for their own communities. But it's mostly something that works online, so that people can most people can benefit. So the, our users are basically uh, currently working on the App Store, and we have also two uh, prototypes, two versions on on Google Play. So uh, we are having all across that. Also, we are working as a web, um, like there is a web version of our application. So collected to all of them, we are we are having that number. Great, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation and thanks for the jury for their questions. Uh, we can move now to the final presentation today. I am so excited to ask the team from Cycle AI to start preparing their presentation. It's actually another wonderful solution using AI to suggest alternative and useful data for users. And I think this is actually what we should spot the light on when we talk about robotics and AI, not the evil side what the movies try to focus on. We, we should really focus on the high value of, of technology and how we can use it really to solve us human like uh, problems using the intelligent like um, robotic uh, smartness and um, uh, we can see already the screen um, I would like to ask the team to start their presentation if they are ready yes of, of course great uh, sorry it's okay please take your time all right so can I start yes please I, I cannot turn the camera on while sharing the screen. Okay. But uh, but I'll uh, I'll turn it as soon as it, as it is finished for the questions. No problem. Okay, please you can start. Okay, great. Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, is Luis Rita, and uh, in uh, there is we are three people in uh, in our team. Uh, me, Luis, Miguel, and Quadrin. Uh, me and Miguel, we are the co-founders. I had a master's project in road safety two years ago in, in Imperial College of London, and Miguel had a, had a bicycle accident. One had the problem, the other had the, the solution. And we joined together and we started Cycle AI. There is a third element, which is Quadrin, the, the web developer, and uh, that is working with us on this project. Our main goal is to empower bicycle riders in fighting for their safety through AI. Having more people cycling, has many benefits, not only environmental benefits, because it reduces the emission of greenhouse gases, but as well, it contributes for more active lifestyles. And we know that one of the main criteria why people don't cycle are their perception of safety. Now you ask me, but how are you empowering bicycle riders to fight for their safety through AI? The answer is we have two crowdsource models in our website. One that we ask users to point in a map places they have passed by the consider of high risk, and a second crowdsource model where we show users two images and we ask which one looks safer. And with this data, the data from the first crowdsource, we used to validate a model Hi, that is able to retrieve a safety score from an image. And with the, the data from second crowdsource, we use it to train the same model. So we have two products. We have an AI, a AI model that is able to extract a safety score from an image. And to achieve this step, we use two crowdsources behind. The way that we used the data from the second crowdsource was by detecting the objects in the images that were voted according to safety and detecting the structures in the same images, we managed to build this AI model. And again, I want to make sure that it's clear we have two products. One AI model from an image takes a safety score and a second one that is able to process in real time uh, video uh, about what is happening in the surroundings of the user. Um, we have gathered through the crowdsources many data from more than 5,000 people, more than 100,000 votes, which is absolutely crucial because it allows us to get the perception of safety, to tell the presence of this object or that structure in that image, the user tends to consider more safe or less safe. And this is what the AI model does, receives an image, extracts a safety score. Our project is highly scalable because we use Google Street View. So every single place where Google Street View is available, we can calculate the safety score. So as a starting point, we build a safety map for, for Lisbon and we created an app, an app that is already available and it is able to tell users between two points, which one is the shortest, the fastest and the safest. Our second model, our second product is the one that's able to see in real time 
what's happening around the user and give real-time information about uh, any risk factors that are around. This is very important because images don't capture dynamic factors, but video does. We target for uh, uh, United Nations sustainable goals, good health, industry, innovation, and infrastructure, sustainable cities, and uh, climate action. And um, we are totally aligned in this project. And um, this has the, the presentation that, that I had prepared for you guys. And I'm open for any questions. Thank you for the presentation. Yes, we can go directly to the questions from the jury. Um, let's see what we have. Um, the first question is coming from Christian, please. Yeah, thanks. Also very interesting technology and um, I think something very new. Uh, what about liability? I mean, we live in the age of innovation, but also in the age of lawsuits and stuff. So um, is there any like danger you get you getting problems here or did you? So when, one, thing, one thing that distinguishes from uh, uh, all the most of the other big companies that also have root planners like Google City Mappers is that all the data that we ask to people and that they give us willingness, willingness in our website, we only use for a single purpose to tell them the, the best route, the safest route. And we don't use it for marketing purpose. We don't use it for nothing else apart from giving the best route. And the algorithms that are not ours are open source. And the algorithms that ours are just ours. We develop ourselves. But the question was when a user is relying on your data and it's, it's used to be or it's um, it appears as a very, as a very safe situation and, and still something happens, um, you know, this can maybe ask questions of liability. Um, did you consider that? Um, in, in this case, the, what we say is that based on our criteria for assessing safety, which is the presence of multiple objects like bicycles, cars, vegetation in the city, we advise people what uh, are the recommended routes without uh, telling them like like telling them this is the safest route you go there this is a recommendation like uh, you have spotify to recommend you music you have uh, many other recommendation systems when you have many options and you don't know which one to pick you can either use it you can you might not use it um at the end of the day that's um, that's our goal because in the cities, the biggest majority of the area, they don't have cycle lanes. And in the areas that they don't have cycle lanes, there is absolutely no way right now to tell which one are the safest. We are think about this as a recommendation to um, what we believe it's the, the safest route, based in very clear criteria that is specified in our website. Okay, great. Thank you. The next question is from Dimitar, please. Uh, what about the, the second product you mentioned? It's a it's a, a real real time uh, information. Uh, have you concern that uh, could be also unsafe to to look on your phone and driving bicycle in the same time? So you the the way it works is that we place these in in the bicycles and we participated in in a, in a contest and we are developing this along with with 5G because the way it works is that we place it in a bicycle. It sends video to to the cloud. And there it's processed. We run the object detection that's able to detect the risk factors. And it's uh, given feedback to the device again based on the factors uh, that were detected. So no images are recorded, no video is, uh, is uh, recorded. Everything is real time processing after detecting the objects in those videos, that video is deleted. And uh, it's provided here on the top of the device uh, light feedback according not only if there is dangerous in front of the, the user, but more importantly, on the back, which was how it happened, uh, the accident for the, the other co-founder. And that was a trigger uh, for this project that above everything is a social impact project. Great, thank you. The last question is going to be from Frank, please. Uh, Frank, we can't hear you, you are muted. Same problem as last time. First, I would say great project. Uh, two questions. How do you refinance all the efforts you have? And second, how uh, do you impact the city planner to make cycling routes more safely? So we, we have two approaches. We are going to start working with uh, one of the, the biggest micro mobility companies right now. And what's going to happen is that they have their own I, their own app, a bike sharing slash micro mobility sharing company, and they are going to have a banner in their app. 
and this banner is going to redirect users to our website. For each click from users from their app, we'll charge a value to this micromobility company. So this is one way to monetize the, our project in a B2B2C approach. But at the same time, we are targeting B2G by giving these maps of safety that are behind the root planner to municipalities and telling them that's a dangerous spot, that's another dangerous spot, accordingly again to our criteria. Um, we are basically automatically using AI to curate what are the most likely dangerous spots in the city. Mm -hmm. And then once we have a list that is short, and then in that case, we don't want to substitute at this point humans uh, completely because it is still the enquete phase that it makes sense. But like as most AI models, both in road safety or medicine, use this to uh, filter the amount of possibilities that you have. And then you give to, to, per, to people like uh, uh, planners, city planners, and then they'll still be able to go to the place and check by themselves which places, if the places are risky or not. But we managed to reduce this is a, a teamwork at the end. Great, thank you so much for the answers and thanks for the jury. I think we are about the end of our session today. Thanks for all the wonderful presentations. Thanks for all the wonderful effort you put on this beautiful innovations and thanks for the jury for their time and for the audience for sure for joining us today. Um, I would like to give the uh, mic further to Manuela. I wonder if you would like to add something in the end. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, what a great session. Thank you to all the winners, the jury members, and of course to you, Abdul. I would like to ask foremost all jury members to stay backstage for one minute. We have a little announcement for you. Um, and to all of you watching, as we took a bit longer for this session, we will only have a short five minutes break before we start with our next exciting panel discussion uh, about European solidarity, Green New Deal, fit for the digital age. After that, we will not have another break, but follow right away with the winner's announcement of the two European champions 2021 at 5.30 sharp. Don't miss it. See you right back. Thank you.